Redwood JS tutorial part three. Welcome back. So in part one, we learned about pages and layouts, how to remove that duplication in our code, generate those on the command line. In part two, we talked to the database. We use the scaffold generator to build all the pages we needed to get records in and out of the database for testing. And some might consider that cheating because the generator did all that work for us, but they can't accuse us of that here in part three because we're gonna do it all from scratch and build a form. No, wait, 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 come back, come back, come back. Yeah, it won't be that bad, I promise. Check it out. Let's build a contact form on our blog so people can send us messages. First thing we're gonna do here is we'll make a page. Call it contact. And then I'll also make the route for us a contact. And then we can put a link to that in our layout. That takes us to the contact page and then we can open that guy up and we'll wrap it in our layout. All right, let's start building our form here. So we're gonna import a couple components from Redwood. Let's import form, label, text field, and submit. And we're gonna start by just using form, just like we would a standard form tag. And then make our label, and I'll change this in a second, but we're gonna also have a text field and you have to give it a name attribute. In this case, it's gonna be the name, like the user's name who's contacting us. And what we'll do is we'll give the same attribute to the label tag and then they're attached. So when you click on the label, you focus on the text field and we'll show some error handling too that depends on these two being linked. And then we'll also have our submit button. So, so far so good. Let's say Rob. You see we get an error down here in our console. So let's fix this. What are we doing here? So by default, our form is gonna want something to do when the submission happens. So we're gonna say on submit. In this case, we'll just make a function with the same name. We'll define it up here. And let's say whatever is passed to this, we're just gonna call data. And let's just log that. So now when I submit, ooh, so it took our input's name of name and gave us a key value object. So our contact form probably have a little bit more than just the name, right? So let's do an email and let's do the message. And the message want to be probably a larger area to type in. So we'll do a text area field. And this will be message and message. Let's take a look now. So now if I say Rob and Rob at redwoodjs.com, let me save it. Ooh, so now we have this little object down here, name, email, message. But what happens if some of these are blank? Let's see if I left this out and tried to submit. Well, this thing doesn't care. It's just gonna go ahead and submit it. Just that email message will be blank. So we don't want that. We definitely want them to be required. So how can we do that? Well, we could try the default uh, HTML required attribute, just say required. Now, if we try to submit, at least we get this, this is the browser's version of a little requirement, which is okay, I guess. But what if we want a little bit more control over that? We want to be able to style what happens when something is required. So what we can do here is get rid of required and we'll give it this validation attribute. And in here, we're gonna say required true. And if we replace these, and now I try to save, well, that area got focused, but nothing else seemed to happen. So let's pass another attribute here. Let's pass error class name, error. And what that says is if this validation does not pass, then take this input and apply this class name error. And if you go into index.css here, I cheated ahead of time. I created just a couple styles to help clean up the uh, input a little bit. So on buttons, inputs, and labels, we're gonna display block. Outline none gets rid of the blue halo around the inputs, and then labels themselves have a little bit of margin. And I have a couple styles here. They also say, okay, if you if error, the error class is on an input or text error, we're gonna set the border red, text red, same thing for a label. So now if we go back here and save, uh, now the box is highlighted. So what we can do is we'll put this same error 
her class name in these as well. Now they all highlight, and the first one receives focus that's invalid. And then as I type and replace it, then the, their highlight goes away. So that's great, but you know maybe it's maybe this isn't really this isn't really the best, right? So this is not a valid email address yet. This box is still considered valid. So what if we do some email validation? And this won't be the end all be all of email regexes, but let's pretend it's fine for our needs here. We're gonna have, uh, pass an additional key value of pattern. And the value is gonna be this regex. So this is on email, so it's required and it also has to match this pattern. So now if we come over here, and if I said rob at redwood, you can see that it's Aired. But you don't really know why, right? Maybe we, it'd be nice if there's a message here telling us why this is now invalid. So we can introduce another input here, or another import. We're going to say field error. And now we're going to say field error. And once again, the same name attribute. And this is going to be email and message. So now what does that look like? So now if we save, oh, name is required, email is required, message is required. So if I put in Rob, that one goes away. If I start typing my email address, you can see email is not formatted correctly until it gets to be correct, and then that message goes away. And same thing here. And we can pass these same, the same error class name, we can put this on the label. So it's invalid, the actual label is highlighted as well. And the field error is only gonna appear if there is an error. So in this case, we can just give it a regular class name. And in this case, this won't actually highlight red because I didn't add this to my style sheet. So these comes in as spans. So you could create a style for that span, or if you wanted to, you can also just say, style and you can give this a standard style attribute so you can do style color red and the style attribute works on the inputs and labels as well and for the errors you can say style error camel case look at that now let's say you had a form with you know dozens of fields and then maybe they are several pages worth of fields it'd be kind of nice if you didn't have to wait all the way to the end to save it to see that your uh, fields are missing so there's another option you can pass here to form, and this has its own validation attribute, and you can say mode on blur. So now as soon as you leave a field, if it's invalid, it's marked as invalid. Pretty nice. Let's fix that message as required. We'll do it down here and we'll say display block. Okay, great. So we've got our form built. We've got our required fields, but now what are we gonna do with this data? What if we save it to the database? That'll give us a chance to sort of build an SDL and a service from scratch. Let's take a look at that. When we talk about modifying the database, the first thing we're going to do is go to our schema Prisma file. And we'll add our model here. So we have a contact. And it's going to have an ID. There's our name, email message. Created at will be will default to now. So what do we do? We yarn, redwood, db, save. And we'll say create contact and then we'll yarn db up to actually apply that change to the database and then we're going to generate the sdl file so yarn would generate sdl contact and if we take a look at that what did we get so there's our contact type there's our query type and then we have our inputs. We have a create input and an update input. So create input, everything that was required for the database is also required through the GraphQL. And for update, you can update any one particular field you want because none of them are required. So we're going to also want a mutation, right? Because we need to write the new contact to the database. So we didn't get that by default because we don't know, or our, the SDL generator doesn't know what you plan to do with this. So by default, it just does a select only, get them all. So we'll create a mutation. And this is going to be called create contact. And the input is going to be the create contact input. And it's going to be required. 
and then when we're all done, it's going to return a contact. Okay, so that's the SDL. And then what about the service? If you look at the service that we created. It just has enough. It has a resolver for you know the this query type here, contacts. It created this one. So we're going to want one for our new create contact. And it's going to take the data that's input from the browser. And if we go back to our contact page, let's do the uh, create contact mutation here. So we're going to, this is sort of um, GraphQL standard. You kind of do an all caps const for your GraphQL definition. And it's going to accept an input of create contact input type. And here's the actual mutation that we're going to call. And when it's all said and done, we're just going to return the ID. The user isn't going to see this, so we'll just have the GraphQL return the ID of the contact it just created. And then now in our contact page, where we're going to end up using that. So we're going to call our use mutation, which we're going to need to import. Import that from web. And when you use these mutations, what you're going to do is you pass an object with a key variables. And then variables contains any variables you define up here, in our case, input. And then input is going to be the actual object containing the data. And in our case, remember, our form gives us this nicely formatted object. which happens to be in the exact format that that input wants, the create contact input, name, email, message. So what we can do here is in our on submit handler, we'll say create, which is this mutation handler we just created. And we're going to say variables. And the name is input. And in this case, we're just going to give it the data that it got from right here. And now we should, if we fill out our contact form, We don't see any errors, that's a good sign. And if we go to the GraphQL playground, we can actually check and see if it made it in there. So if you go to localhost 8911 GraphQL, you get this guy where you can actually write GraphQL against your schema. Remember we had a contacts type already defined for us. And sure enough, there it is. This is from the GraphQL endpoint. Rob, Robert Redwood.js, hello. All right, is there anything we can do to improve this form? So usually you think about any form on the web and what happens if the user double clicks the submit button or clicks it hundreds of times as fast as they can before the server can get a chance to respond. It's actually gonna submit multiple times, right? So we can prevent that. A couple extra variables we can get back from use mutation. One of them is loading. So this will be true while it's waiting for this mutation to perform, and then loading will be false once it's done. So what we can do is we can say loading, we're going to disable the submit button while that is happening. So we come over here and say disabled equals loading. And now while loading is true, the button will be disabled. And then once it's done, it'll be re-enabled. And we can double check that here. If we go to our network tab and we simulate, let's say simulate slow 3G, And we submit, we see that button grayed out, grayed out, grayed out, grayed out, grayed out, boop, and it pops back in. You can use it again. Okay, that's pretty cool. But these fields still have values in them, which is kind of annoying. Like now the person could just click submit, 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 repeat that same message over and over again. So can we clear out those form fields after a submit? And it turns out we can. This one will require a little more work, but what we're going to do here is we're going to import use form from React hook form. So Redwood.js actually uses React Hook form behind the scenes, and most of these helpers actually just wrap React Hook form calls for you, so you don't have to do all this stuff manually. But in this case, we will if we want to reset the form. So what we're going to do is we're going to get access to this use form, 
And then in here, we're gonna get those form methods that React Hook form gives us. So we're gonna const form methods, use form. And then what we need to do is tell Redwood, okay, I'm manually do, calling use form, so you don't have to do it. Use these form methods instead. So now here in our form call, we're gonna say form methods equals form methods. So now Redwood knows to use those. But what that gives us is access to the reset function. So yet another parameter you can pass here. So use mutation, you can pass as a second parameter, which is uh, some callbacks, one of which is on completed. And we can say when you're done, we're going to form methods reset. And we'll also say, we'll also give you an alert box that says, thank you for your message. But as soon as the mutation is finished, it'll reset the form, show an alert box. There we go, thank you for your message. And as soon as I clear this, now the form's reset. You may have noticed these labels here are sort of lowercase and ugly. That's because by default, the label will just take that name attribute and use that for the label. So what we can do here is override that. You can say something like your name and your email, your message. Looks a little nicer. Now, if you've been around the internet for any length of time, you've probably heard the phrase, don't trust the client. And that's because, you know, the client, the person using the client, I should say, has access to the code and can make changes to things and submit potentially bad data to the server. So what do we do about displaying messages from the server? So for example, let's say someone was able to get access to this form and remove this validation for email. They could come in here. And our server will happily save that. It has no idea. The database doesn't care what the format of this field is. It's just a text. So what we should really do is add some validation on the server itself. So let's take a look at that. A nice place to do that might be here in our service. This is sort of the last point before it touches the database. So what we can do is let's create a validation function. And this is going to take the input, right, that we're getting here. It's going to say if email is present and the email doesn't match this regex, we're going to throw this user input error. We're going to import this from Redwood. This is Redwood API. And you're going to uh, return this object of messages and the email in this case is not formatted like an email address. What we'll do is we'll call this here before we create. And then what we do to get access to that is these parameters here that we gave to our create. There's loading. There's another one we can give it here, error. And you could go in here and manually say, right, error and and, you know, there is an error. But of course, Redwood wants to make your life simpler always. So we have another field here we can import called form error. And what we can do is right after the opening form tag, we'll put that here, form error. And we're going to pass it the error that we're going to get from the mutation, right, which is right up here. So this error goes in here, an error, and that's a self-closing tag. And then we'll give that same error to the form itself. So now what happens if we have an invalid address? Oh, we can look at that. We get an error from the server at the top of the page here. Can't create new contact. Email's not formatted like an email address. And it highlights the email field just as if it was an inline error. And what we can do is we can style this. So rather than have a class like I had for my inputs, I'll show you how to do this inline here. So what we can do here is we're going to say wrapper style. So there's a couple different attributes. You can view these in the docs, but the wrapper is what wraps the entire uh, div that appears when there's an error. And we'll do color red and background color. Here's a neat one. Lavender blush. All right, that's about enough for part three, I think. Come on back for part four and we'll actually deploy this somewhere on the internet.